Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. Sorry. <clears throat> Hello. If you're new, my name's Connor. I like to learn about things. Let's get cozy now. Thank you. Um, why was Normandy selected for D-Day? Good question. Let's find out. Let's learn. The original link to the video, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. Click on it. Send it right over there. We'd love to have you. Makes it easier for me to interact with you and see your recommendations. But no beggy if it's not your thing. So, um, I believe, like, one of the really cool things I learned about in uh, preparations for, for D-Day, for the invasion of, of Europe, was that they would use blown up, like, blow inflatable tanks and trucks and whatnot and set them up so that when German reconnaissance planes were going over to see where British and, you know, allied forces are gathering, they, they would mistake it as gathering in one area. And um, I think Calais is the most reasonable decision, right? Because it's closest. And I think that's why they didn't do it. Uh, that, that, that's about as far as my knowledge goes. My great uncle, um, I've been to Normandy twice. My great uncle was killed um, on uh, Omaha Beach. Uh, it's a beautiful, extremely well-kept place. It's uh, The French do a really good job. This is the BBC Home Service, and here... Guys, sorry, just like... Okay. Is... This is the BBC Home Service, and here is a special bulletin read by Simon Clark. D-Day has come. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern face of Hitler's European fortress. The first official news came just after half past nine, when Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force issued communique number one. This said, under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The Allied Commander-in-Chief, General Eisenhower, has issued an order of the day addressed to each individual of the Allied Expeditionary Force. In it, he said, your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. On June 6th... I always wondered, what, what would be more terrifying, uh, being the German soldier seeing this giant invasion force on the horizon coming to invade you or being the ones landing. I would assume the worst would be being the first ones to land, but at a certain point, once they establish a beachhead, um, it must have been terrifying. So Together to victory. I feel bad, like slouching. On June 6th, 1944, the world awoke to earth-shattering news. Allied forces, led by Britain and America, had begun the invasion of Hitler's Europe. By the end of this day, 156,000 Allied troops were on French ground, supported by 6,939 vessels, with over 14,674 sorties by aircraft throughout the day. Within five days, 54,186 vehicles and 104,428 tons of supplies were transported on land. These factors came together to form perhaps the most audacious invasion in the history of humankind. Two years of research, development and planning culminated in a day that we associate with chaos and violence. But little consideration is ever made for the carefully choreographed procedure that made this day, in the end, an iconic day of success. This is the logistics of D-Day. Two years prior to D-Day, on the 19th of August, 1942, 
Allied Canadian forces attempted to land here in Dieppe, some 135 kilometers away from the beaches of Normandy and suffered a humiliating defeat. The Allies, expecting the element of surprise to be enough to win the battle, made critical strategic mistakes. Lack of communication, inadequate surveying of the beach's gradient and geology, poor planning of routes inland, along with little knowledge of German fortifications, led to a complete rout. Of the 4,963 men that landed on the beaches of Dieppe, 916 Canadian soldiers were killed and around 2,450 were wounded, with many of those also being taken as prisoners of war. Lack of communication between the commanders at sea and the men on the beach led to additional landing craft being sent in when there was no space to land. The 29 tanks that managed to land were barely able to move in the loose shingle beaches, often digging trenches with their tracks and becoming stuck. I just have to get a medic, my medic. Supposed to take a medication. Only 15 of these tanks made it into the town, where their guns were too weak to take on the strong German fortifications. With little to no air support or naval artillery, they were doomed to failure. But this failure would form the textbook of what not to do in an amphibious assault and lay the groundwork for D-Day. In this episode of the logistics of D-Day, we are going to explore the science and logic in choosing the beaches of Normandy as their landing location. The Allies controlled the seas, giving them immense power in deciding where to begin their attack. D-Day's goal was to create a new Western Front to ease pressure on the Soviets fighting a bitter war on the Eastern Front and spread the Axis powers even thinner as the Americans pushed up from the south in Italy. To do this, the Allies needed to open a new Atlantic Front. Coastlines stretching from Norway to the south of France were considered and juggling the myriad of factors into choosing a location was never going to be an easy task. In an ideal world, the Allies Norway, would have chosen huh? beaches closest to Great Britain, like those of Calais and Dunkirk. This would satisfy some of the primary requirements for the invasion. The short sea crossing would ease the shipment of supplies and personnel across the English Channel, and it was within range of even the shortest range of Allied fighters, like the Spitfire, a vital requirement even though the Luftwaffe was well defeated by D-Day. Air support would play a obvious, pivotal role right? in D-Day operations, from landing power troopers, attacking coastal fortifications, disrupting reinforcements, patrolling shipping lanes, towing gliders, and distributing supplies. The range of Allied fighters was a major logistical concern. And while Calais and Dunkirk were the best locations in terms of distance, the Germans were all too aware of this and had erected strong fortifications and focused the brunt of their forces in these areas. These areas were avoided for this reason, but the defences stretched far beyond just Calais. A vast line of defences had been hurriedly built stretching from the Spanish border all the way to the north of Norway, consuming 17 million cubic metres of concrete and 1.2 million tonnes of steel. Enough concrete and steel to construct over 150 of these gigantic flak towers that the Nazis constructed to protect their major cities. This material was used to create thousands of smaller bunkers and trenches up and down the coast, with the greatest concentrations being found near vital ports like Cherbourg, Antwerp and Brest. Because this was the next requirement to ensure success, any invasion would be short-lived without a steady supply of equipment and men. The Allies had early contingency plans with massive temporary harbours that were erected directly onto the chosen beaches, but as we will learn in future episodes, these would not satisfy the needs. Cherbourg was identified as a key port of interest, primarily due to its location on the Cotentin Peninsula, a peninsula which could be cut off from reinforcements and captured early. Here, Normandy was the clear choice, being both within fighter range and in close proximity proximity to Cherbourg. Normandy was quickly becoming the prime contender for Operation Overlord, but the job was nowhere near finished and Normandy could have been dropped for alternatives. Normandy needed to have suitable geology and terrain, and to determine this was going to require an immense information gathering effort and the Allies used every tool in their arsenal to ensure their strategy would lead to success. This sometimes was as simple as requesting holiday photos and postcards from pre 
pre-war trips from citizens. But this information clearly wasn't enough to plan an invasion, and two years before D-Day, a massive aerial reconnaissance campaign began to survey the Atlantic coast, probing for weak points and gathering strategic information. The RAF 140 Squadron were tasked with high-flying photo reconnaissance missions, equipped with Spitfires modified with F-52 cameras fitted just below and behind the wings. They were to photograph all coastal defences from Calais to Cherbourg, photographing Jeez. potential locations for temporary airfields, surveying transportation links in France, identifying German fortifications, and assessing the gradients of each potential beach on that stretch of coast. The Allies were determined not to make the same mistakes as Dieppe, and this would require the beach's geology to be assessed to ensure their tanks and equipment could be transported inland for the first wave of attacks. Their work was cut out for them. Avoiding German anti-aircraft fire and fighters was just one challenge. Getting the incredibly specific conditions needed to determine the gradient of the beaches was another. In order to determine the gradient of the beaches, several photos had to be taken. One with an average low tide, one with an average high tide, and four pictures at various points between the two extremes. This would give several elevation data points to inform us of the beach's gradient. Just if this was not hard enough, water. winds could not be greater than 37 kilometers per hour to avoid surge tides interfering with results. They needed to take the photos during sunset or sunrise in order to get decent contrast between the water and the beach, and they needed a clear day with no clouds obscuring the view. These photos were combined. So insane. It's like little things like this. It's the little things that show you just how many little things were this is these are little things about uh, yes about the d-day operation but about one part of the war and just the the amount of thought and how uh, it's like the entirety of every nation in the war in in the war effort on either side of the war it, it is is like your job your your brain is for either building stuff for the war or thinking about stuff for the war and it's a crazy thing they needed a clear day with no clouds obscuring the view these that photos were combined with tidal information to create detailed charts of beach gradients and lengths along with high and low water marks and thankfully normandy's beaches were found to have a favorable gradient normandy had a lot going for it it was relatively poorly defended was within range of allied fighters had a short sea crossing which would allow for a quick turnaround of supply ships the english channel had only two relatively narrow entry points which would be more easily defended from u-boats and the beaches would be shielded from the worst of strong atlantic winds by the cotatan peninsula Normandy was quickly becoming the primary contender for the invasion. Now it was time for fine detail planning. Beach gradient info was not enough. The chosen beaches needed to be capable of bearing the load of heavy tanks and vehicles that would eventually land there. This could not be done with planes. This needed men on the ground. About six months prior to D-Day, on a moonless New Year's Eve, Major Logan Scott Bowden and Sergeant Bruce Ogden Smith of the Royal Engineers boarded a boat that would bring them within a quarter mile of Gold Beach, one of the final British landing sites. From there, they swam ashore where they quickly took samples of the beach using a metal auger and swam back through heavy surf to return the samples for analysis. That's some James the Allies Bond knew stuff. ahead of time that these beaches would be suitable, characterized by medium grain sand, too fine grain sand or mud would result in the heavy equipment sinking and too coarse a grain made it difficult to maneuver. Medium was just right. These samples however ultimately let the British know that provisions would need to be taken to overcome the softer than expected sand. Many of the tanks on D-Day came with modifications to allow them to deal with the terrain they would encounter. Many Churchill tanks were fitted with these carpet laying spools that would lay over soft sand to increase the surface area over which the pressure was being exerted. 
They could also be used to lay over barbed wire defences. Others were fitted with simple rolls of wood which could be dropped into anti-tank trenches to allow traversal, much more cost effective than these early tests wasting two tanks to fill a ditch. This wasn't the only geology the Allies needed to consider. Suitable locations for temporary runways needed to be identified. This would require long stretches of flat, firm ground with excellent drainage, very close to the original landing sites. The Calvados Plateau, located here, consisted of limestone covered in sand, deposited by the last ice age. Over thousands of years, acidic rainwater created thousands of underground drainage holes, sinkholes and caves, allowing any rainwater to drain quickly. This area was perfect and several airstrips sprang up within days of the first landings, like Saint-Pierre-Dumont, which began construction on D-Day plus one and finished construction on D-Day plus two, the 8th of June. It witnessed a constant stream of aircraft coming in for fuel, ammunition and repairs, while also serving as an evacuation zone for the injured. In the month that followed... It's so amazing what we can do and figure out and solve and overcome when we are... when humans are, like, all for one thing. And it's, it's impossible to happen un un unless your country is threatened, unless... It seems like it's something during wartime that cannot be replicated. It's like people are only hardwired to go this hard full in when it's like the you know the nation is 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 under threat. D-Day, the front line progressed only 19 kilometers from this point, and it was a vital supply point for the advancing army. Like this was just feeling, one of like many sad, advanced happy. landing grounds that were created over the course of the campaign, each serving as a valuable forward base to allow the Allies to gain air superiority in the immediate vicinity patrolling roads and attacking German strongholds to allow the progress of the front line. These supply line logistics will be fleshed out more in a future episode. Ultimately, Normandy was chosen because it had the right mix of geology, had the port of Cherbourg close enough to capture, but also had suitable alternative supply options until those days came. The English Channel made it easier to defend against German U-boat ports in Norway, Germany and along the west coast of France. It may have been heavily defended too, but as we will see in the next episode of the logistics of D-Day, which is available exclusively on Nebula, Allied deception tactics would play a vital role in making the Germans doubt Normandy as the chosen location. I think that, you know, I've seen, I've watched a lot of different videos of like, you know, was Germany doomed to fail from, from the beginning, from invading Poland? Um, and it seems like, uh, uh, you know, oil and, and fuel shortages were the main thing. But I, I wonder if, if, if World War II, if Great Britain holding out and not surrendering is what saved Europe from Germany. Obviously, you know, America helping out and stuff, but the fact that Great Britain didn't succumb to Germany before you know, America came in and before, you know, after, you know, the shock value of France falling so fast wore off. Um, because if, if Great Britain was, was, was taken by Germany, but before these, these D-Day preparations were even being thought about, there, there's no way you can transport an invasion force over the Atlantic, oh, voice crack, right? Over the Atlantic Ocean. And so, where would you land? I mean, not just where would you land, how would you get people there? So you'd probably have to get some, establish some sort of front in, that, in Northern Africa on the Atlantic coast, like Morocco or something like that, and then make your way through the desert or, or try and force your way into the Mediterranean. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just... Clearly, Germany was not faring well before the Allied in successful landing in France, right? And two fronts opened up. Clearly, they were having problems in Russia and the Soviet Union without opening up a, a second front or having to face a second front. But if they only had one front to save, uh, to worry about, and they still only had to, all attention on Stalin. I wonder if if 
you know, was Germany still doomed? Um, anyways, I mean, regardless, the fact that you had the, the aircraft carrier base off of Europe that allies could, I, I'm talking, I'm, I'm reiterating myself, that allies could prep and have a landing platform. Uh, you know what I mean? The next vital role in making the Germans doubt Normandy as the chosen location. The next three episodes of this series is now available for you to watch in Nebula. Episode 2 deals with deception tactics, episode 3 with the methods the Allies used to blow a hole in the wall of Fortress Europe, and episode 4 explores the landing craft that landed hundreds of thousands of men, vehicles and supplies directly onto the beaches. There are many more episodes to come over the next couple of months, and the best way to watch them is by signing up to Curiosity Stream, which is now only 11 Make sure to use promo codes, any of the channels I watch that have uh, sponsors. 11 99 for the entire year. For that 11 99 you will get access to all the fantastic really cool award-winning documentaries on CuriosityStream and get access to Nebula bundled with it for free. On Nebula, you will get access to this series along with many oh, more original series aliens, from please. Wendover Productions, Tier Zoo, and City Beautiful. My new favorite is Tom Scott's fantastic Tom new Scott. game show, Money. Nebula started just a few months ago and is now transformed into a legitimate streaming platform that has allowed creators like me to experiment more freely with our videos, without worries of punishment from the YouTube algorithm. If that sounds like something you want to support, head on over to curiositystream.com forward slash real engineering to get your year long access money. for just eleven ninety nine. Use the real engineering slash real engineering guys if that interests you. Really cool video. I uh, would love to see any of you guys answer my questions or have any con comments at all. I uh, would love to read them, see them. Hope you guys are all doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be okay. Don't worry. Emotions are fickle. See you guys. Bye.